Happy Sunday, everybody. Grab your coffee and your Bibles, and we'll start into our last Baptist distinctive. And I'm sure you're experts by now and can quote this acronym with me. B is for biblical authority. The Bible is where we get all of our beliefs. A is for autonomy of the local church. Each church rules itself. P is for priesthood of the believer. You can go to God directly without need for any other human being except for Jesus. T is for two ordinances, baptism and Lord's Supper. I is for individual soul liberty. Each person has the liberty to choose what to believe. They could be right, they could be wrong, but I cannot force someone to think what they do not want to think. S is for saved church membership. Uh, T is for two offices, pastor and deacon. And today's S is for separation of church and state. And the doctrine says that God has established both the church and the government. Therefore, they're both good things. However, God gave them different jobs to do. They're different. No church or government should control the other one. Neither should there be any alliance between the two. They're both good. They're both given by God, but they are different. Believers can and should, however, promote righteousness in the government as in all areas of living. You do not stop becoming a Christian when you go to vote or when you go to participate in government. Uh, Christians who get elected to office do not stop being Christians and their Christianity should inform their politics. There's an example in the Old Testament of a little bit of separation of church and state. Uh, the kings of Israel were supposed to be godly examples. They were supposed to do right and to lead the people uh, towards God. However, they were not priests. They were not allowed to lead worship. They were not allowed to sacrifice. They were not allowed into the Holy of Holies. They were not priests. There was one time when Saul, first king of Israel, tried to sacrifice. Uh, he actually did sacrifice and uh, Samuel said, God does not appreciate that. You're not going to be king for very long because you disobeyed God. In the New Testament, of course, the New Testament church had no authority over the Roman government. Um, we'll look more about that in just a minute. Total separation of church and state is impossible. It's just not going to work. Each one has a responsibility to the other. Uh, not only that, but church citizens are American citizens. Uh, every American citizen has some ideas about religion, even atheism. A lot of people call that a religion because it is your ideas about God and the church and life and death and all that kind of thing. So every, every citizen of the country has religious ideas. Every church member of the country has political ideas. You just cannot separate the two 100%. Uh, so then the question uh, comes, well, well, how should the church and state treat one another? I'm sure you've been told or, or learned this in history class that the phrase separation of church and state comes from Thomas Jefferson in a letter that he wrote to some churches. He said, erecting the wall of separation between church and state is absolutely essential in a free society. However, did he know separation of church and state is a lot older than Thomas Jefferson? Uh, it is older than the rest of our founding fathers. Besides, we do not base church doctrine on what Thomas Jefferson said or any founding father. Uh, you could base your politics on what Jefferson said. That's fine. He was a politician. Uh, but do not base your religious beliefs on what the founding fathers said. That is a no-no. Remember, A, uh, I'm sorry, not A, B is for biblical authority. Sorry, that's where I got the, the A, biblical authority. Besides, if you wanted to rest your doctrine on the words of a founding father, do not pick Thomas Jefferson. He literally took a Bible and cut and pasted it. He bought two New Testaments and used scissors and a pot of glue to cut out the parts that he liked and the parts that he didn't like and assembled his own Bible called the Jefferson Bible, which I have seen in Barnes and Noble bookshelves today. Uh, not cool. He is not the source of our doctrine. The early church had absolutely no influence on the Roman government. They were, in fact, heavily persecuted. Uh, many early Christians were killed on the orders of the Roman government, uh, including Jesus and Paul. In 313 AD, the Emperor Constantine made Christianity the state religion, so now you have to be Christian. Um, then a problem came. When there are different 
Christian groups, different churches that are preaching different things, who gets to decide which is correct? And the emperor decided that he was the one to decide. And from then on, uh, there were multiple different emperors who led church councils to determine church doctrine. Well, what gives the emperor the authority to decide church doctrine? And then the biblical authority that the church was based on is now based on biblical authority and the emperor's authority. And there's a lot of problems when the emperor or king or government is also in charge of the church, such as if you disagree with the emperor religiously, you must be a traitor because you're an enemy of the king politically as well, because there is no difference between religion and politics. That's not good. That's not okay. For the next 1300 years, particularly during the Middle Ages, the church and the state were intertwined inextricably. They were one being. Sometimes the kings controlled the church. They did this through a process called lay investiture, where the kings got to hire all the bishops and archbishops, and sometimes even the pope. Well, when the bishops and archbishops owe their job to the king, they preach what the king tells them to preach, and they take the king's side on every matter. Uh, and, and they make sure if you are an enemy of the king politically, then you're an enemy of the church religiously as well, and, and vice versa. That's not good. Well, sometimes the church controlled the kings, and the church would do this by threatening or actually enacting excommunication. And they said, we can send kings to hell if we like, so do what we say. Um, king John of England, uh, you might recognize him as the snake in Robin Hood, and <laughs> King John, the, the wicked king of England, uh, no, he wasn't the snake. He was he was a lion too, but he was the bad lion. Anyway, King John was so angry at the church and they fought so much that the Pope didn't just excommunicate King John. The Pope put all of England under interdict, which means all of England was excommunicated because their king ticked off the Pope. And so very soon all of England revolted and made King John grovel to the Pope and get them unexcommunicated. But can you imagine the power that the church had to say this entire country is going to hell unless their king does what I say? That is way too much power. No one should be wielding that power. And of course, that's completely unbiblical. Uh, and, and the long and short of it is when either one tries to control the other, there's going to be lots of fighting and lots of people are going to die. In the early 1600s, the doctrine of separation of church and state began forming, and Baptists were the first major group to subscribe to this doctrine in modern history. Uh, some took the doctrine way too far. There's a group called the Anabaptists, not to be confused with Baptists, but some of these people said that Christians should absolutely ignore the government because the government is wicked and evil. And I could totally see how they got that impression because the government of their time was pretty wicked and evil. Uh, but then they said that government as a concept is wrong as well. Not just the current king was bad, but the idea of kings is wicked and evil. So they said, we're never going to vote if we have the opportunity. We're never going to pay our taxes. Uh, when enemies invaded and there was a draft, they dodged the draft. Uh, and they basically said, we will refuse to obey any law and not recognize the authority of any governor, magistrate, lawyer, you know, and anything like that. They all got burnt at the stake. Uh, they were they were killed and tortured and thrown in jail and, and all sorts of bad stuff uh, happened to them. And then they claimed that that was uh, religious persecution. But I don't know if that was as much religious persecution as much as political persecution. You know, you don't pay your taxes, you don't obey the law, and the government gets mad at you. Go figure. Uh, one group thought that Jesus had to have an opening for him to come back. You know, the Bible says that Jesus would be king of the world one day. Oh, but we already have a king. So if we murder the king, maybe Jesus will come be king of England. And so they actually had an assassination plot on the king so that there would be no king of England. So Jesus could be king of England. Uh, they were caught and did not manage to assassinate the king. Uh, but everyone associated with that group was in big trouble and a group of baptists there was a very small uh, group of baptists in england at the time they wrote a letter to the king saying we think that kings are okay and even if we disagree with you politically we would never try to murder a king or assassinate a king because we believe that kings have god-given authority regardless of if you are doing a good job or not 
Others did not take the doctrine of separation far enough, and they just replaced governmental persecution of themselves with government persecution of other people. So they said, we don't want freedom of religion. We, we want freedom of my religion, not freedom of your religion. And most notably in America, the Puritans in Massachusetts did this. Uh, that is how we got several New England states because they banished anyone who did not agree with them religiously uh, out to the woods. And that is actually how we got Rhode Island when the first Baptist preacher in America uh, came to uh, Massachusetts and he started preaching his doctrine and the Puritan said, we disagree with you on a couple of matters, so out you go, you get to go live in the woods. And he did okay, he started a new state. History of the doctrine is fascinating, I find, but just because this group thought this or that group thought that, just because Jefferson says this or Washington says that, that's no way to have a doctrine. So we need to focus on what does the Bible say on this topic, not what does the king say or anything like that. So Baptists recognize that Government has authority because God gives it authority. Government is not a man-made institution. It is a divinely ordained institution. And therefore, government as a concept is a very good idea. Whether or not our government is obeying God is not exactly the point. Uh, the point is, is government from God? Does government have authority? And the answer is absolutely yes. And the classic text we can go to is Romans chapter 13. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. I don't think Paul can be any clearer here. The government represents God's justice. And if you disobey the government, you are disobeying God. This is very clear, cut and dry obey the government every soul obey the government because no authority exists apart from god's authority and god gave the government their authority obey the government do you want to get into a fight with god then obey the government talks about the the minister of god he is the minister of God, the, the governor, is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Therefore, he must needs be subject not only for wrath, but also for the conscience sake. So our modern cops and, and National Guard don't wear swords anymore. They, they wear you know, nine mils and, and other weapons. And it says they don't carry those weapons in vain. That is, there is a reason the cops carry guns, because they have the right to rule by force. They have the right to use even deadly force if the situation warrants it. And I won't get into whether every shooting there's ever been has been warranted or not. Obviously not. Uh, but there is a reason that we give our law enforcement officers weapons. They are a minister to God, and they are here for your good. But if you are disobeying, you ought to be afraid. If you are doing what's right, you ought not to be afraid of the cops. If you are afraid of the cops, there's one of two things wrong here. Either you are doing wrong or the cops are doing wrong. Maybe both. But the cops are supposed to be dispensing justice, helping the good, and punishing the evil. When God wants to show his wrath on evildoers, he does not throw lightning bolts very often. <laughs> I don't think God does that ever anymore. When God wants to punish sin, he sends a cop. He sends a soldier. He sends some sort of law enforcement officer to punish that wicked person. He sends a judge. He sends a, a jury to punish that person. So when you look around saying, you know, how come God isn't destroying the wicked? He is. He is. He's using the law enforcement officers to be his ambassadors to earth. The last verse here, verse 5, says, This is why you need to obey, not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. Obey, number one, because you could get shot if you don't, so obey. Obey, number two, because it's the right thing to do. So keep your body safe, keep your conscience clear by obeying God, by obeying the law. 
For this cause pay ye tribute, or taxes also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. There's a text in Malachi that I've heard trotted out a lot that says, you know, if you don't pay your tithes to God, you're robbing God. Well, here in Romans, it says, if you're not paying your taxes to the government, you're robbing God. Because the government's doing God's work, just like the church is doing God's work. It's a different aspect of God's work. The government's doing God's work, so you need to pay your taxes. It says you owe taxes, but it also says you owe custom and fear and honor. When it says to whom fear is due, that means you owe them your respect. If they are in authority over you, you owe them because they are from God. Next time... You want to complain about a politician, you're free to complain about a politician, but make sure you do it with respect because that politician is representing God. They may be doing a terrible job of it, but they're supposed to be representing God. What is the responsibility of the government to us? The Bible doesn't say a whole lot about the government's responsibility to the church as much as to citizens in general. And it, it tells very, very few specifics. It is very difficult to talk about any specific uh, law and say, well, here's the verse that says this is good. Uh, for instance, all it says about taxes is pay them. Um, doesn't say should the tax rate be 10%, 12%, 32%. It doesn't say. You could argue that from a political standpoint, from an economic standpoint, you cannot argue tax rates from a biblical standpoint. But the Bible does have an awful lot to say about how the government should act. It says the, the government's job is to reward good and punish evil, to protect the, the ones who are doing good under their charge. And the modern government in America has two main methods of protecting its citizens. Cops protect citizens from other citizens and the army protects citizens from outside threats. We hear a lot today about social justice, and the Bible says an awful lot about social justice. It just calls it justice in society. But the government's job is to promote justice in its nation. Uh, bribery is completely against the Bible. There are dozens of verses against bribery. Exodus 23, 8, and thou shalt take no gift. For, that is meaning a bribe, not like a present, of course. For the gift blindeth the wise and perverteth the words of the righteous. Uh, bribery messes up government, and it is common in every government in the world, and has been for thousands of years. Bribery is not okay. I remember the first really major instance of bribery that, that I heard about in the government was uh, many years ago when President Obama uh, resigned his Senate seat to become president. Uh, Governor Blagojevich tried to sell his Senate seat. The governor is in charge of filling the seat for the time being until there could be a, a new election for uh, President Obama's former seat. And he sold it and he got caught and he got thrown in jail. He's been in jail for, what, about 12 years now. And President Trump just pardoned him. Uh, so he's he's out of prison now. Uh, but he, he accepted or, or asked for tens of thousands of dollars to pervert justice. And of course, he's not alone. Governor Blagojevich there. There's, there's plenty of people in government, even in recent years, who have been accused of bribery. And that's not okay. That is not biblical. Now, the government should enforce equality. Uh, Leviticus 19.15, ye shall do no one righteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty, but in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Now, I know it says you don't honor these people. It means more than anyone else. So it's equal honor, equal honor opportunity for everyone. You do not treat the rich or the poor better than the other. You give equal justice to both. And that, of course, is enshrined in our 14th Amendment, equal justice under law. Uh, when you treat one class of people different from another class, whether it's race or, or here socioeconomic background, that is not okay. Um, in righteousness, judge the laws. Uh, the Bible says to, that the government ought to stand up for the poor and the oppressed. Exodus 23, 6, thou shalt not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. The word rest means to wrench or twist or break. Uh, do not destroy justice uh, from the poor. 
maybe you're expecting bribes from the people that you help and the poor can't afford to bribe you so not going to help you that's not okay you need to stand up for the poorest and most helpless among us exodus 23 9 talks about fair immigration policies also thou shalt not oppress a stranger that's a, a foreigner an immigrant for you know the heart of a stranger seeing you were strangers in the land of egypt I think it's very interesting how both Israel and America know what it's like to be immigrants. Israel was foreign, uh, there were foreigners in Egypt for hundreds of years, and America is almost completely made of immigrants. We know what it's like to be immigrants, so we need to treat new immigrants fairly. Again, this does not give you any ammunition to use in any particular law. Uh, there's, there's multiple different uh, ideas and strategies for immigration policy and this just very vaguely says be kind be fair be just um, and, and we need to make sure that happens with modern day immigrants in america next fair wages leviticus 19 13 thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor neither rob him the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night till the morning so pay a just wage pay on time if the boss does not pay a fair wage he is robbing his workers uh, now the modern american strategy for doing this is with things like minimum wage and that is one way of doing it and again what should the minimum wage be Leviticus doesn't say a, a number for that. It needs to be fair. Well, what does fair mean? Uh, I'm sure that uh, the fair wage is going to change from year to year, maybe even from town to town or state to state. Uh, the, the price of living in different states is very different from one another, so maybe they do not need the same minimum wage. I, I don't know. But there needs to be justice in your, uh, in your business dealings. The Bible told the, the Jewish government to give food to the poor and hungry. Leviticus 19, 9-10. And when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and the stranger, again, for the immigrant. You got to feed them. I am the Lord your God. Here he says, feeding the poor is because I am God. I'm God. Those are human beings that I made. I made them in my image. I love them. You need to feed them. How the modern American government does this is with things like food stamp programs uh, and unemployment checks and, and things like that. Uh, how much should that be? Again, doesn't say, but you do need to consider God cares for the poor and the hungry, and God commands us to feed them not just through the church or the community but through the government it is the government's job to feed the poor and hungry uh, regardless of whose fault it is that they're hungry if they're hungry you feed them that's just basic human dignity the american with disabilities Act was passed in what was it, the 1960s or 70s uh, and i think the bible does have something to say about that leviticus 19 14 thou shalt not curse the deaf nor put a stumbling block before the blind but, but shall fear thy god i am the lord once again doing rights uh, to people with disabilities is because god said i am the lord i'm the one who made the deaf i'm the one who made the blind i'm the one who made everyone with disabilities you treat them right don't swear at a deaf person behind his back because he can't hear you and oh, it's so funny. Don't try to trip a blind person. That's cruel. The American with Disabilities Act says uh, a lot of things. Uh, one of the things it says is any public space needs to be accessible by every American. So if there's a public space, there needs to be wheelchair ramps and, and things like that uh, so that anyone can, can have access to it. That is not a modern American concept. God said that thousands of years ago. The government has a responsibility to everyone in its care, but especially the poor, the weak, the hungry, those with disabilities, foreigners, immigrants, that kind of person. What is the responsibility of the church to the government? What is the responsibility of the church to the government then? Well, first of all, we need to pray. That is not the least we can do. That is the most we can do for the government. 
in First Timothy, uh, Paul says you need to pray for everyone, and he lists a few kinds of people that you should pray for, and now he says also pray for kings and all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. He did not say pray that our taxes go down or whatever. He said pray that the government just leaves us alone and, and lets us worship God in the way that we see fit. Let the government just be peaceful to us and, and let us worship God in the church. That's a very low bar uh, for what he's expecting from the government. And, you know, he had, he had Nero and Caligula, uh, two very awful emperors. And he says, can you just pray that Nero will stop killing us? Can you just pray that Nero will let us preach the gospel? That's all we want. A very important responsibility of the church as a whole and Christians uh, in, in specific is to confront sin in the government. Now, of course, no one is perfect. Everyone sins. All politicians sin. But we need to hold our politicians responsible when they commit egregious sins in public. Now, we do not expect uh, an atheist politician to act like a Christian. And so maybe we don't need to you know, throw a temper tantrum every time they, they do something that a Christian ought not to do. But when there are some major sins happening uh, in public, we need to hold our elected officials responsible for that. And there are many examples in the Bible of Christian leaders telling the government, you're sinning. I think uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the sin of adultery. Uh, King David had sinned publicly with Bathsheba. Everyone knew about it. The whole town was talking about this. Uh, and of course, the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And uh, thou art the man, Nathan said. That's Old Testament. What about New Testament? John the Baptist. John the Baptist preached against Herod in Mark 6, 18. John had said unto Herod, it is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Because he preached against sin, Herod threw him in jail and eventually cut off his head. And John the Baptist knew he would get in trouble for preaching against the king's sin. And yet he did it anyway. He gave up his life to confront sin. See, when the people in charge sin, and the church says nothing, we're being complicit with the sin. Silence is saying that it's okay. And it's not okay when elected officials commit adultery. We have had many, many politicians in the last decade or so commit adultery on every level, from the state level to Congress uh, to presidents. Uh, President Clinton committed adultery very openly in front of everyone. I'm sure he didn't mean to get caught, but man, it was all in the news for how long? And the church needs to say, President Clinton, thou shalt not commit adultery. President Trump also committed adultery. And it, it's really sad that some Christians did say, President Trump, thou shalt not commit adultery. But many Christians said, well, I like his politics better than Clinton's. And so it's none of our business. I read a statistic that said about three times more Christians were, uh, were confronting Clinton over his sin than Trump. And that's not okay. Sin is sin no matter which politician is doing it. Don't commit adultery. Infanticide. It, when Israel was in, was, was in Egypt, the Pharaoh gave the order to kill all baby boys. Exodus 117 says, the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men and children alive. They refused to obey the, the government's order to murder. We don't have infanticide in America exactly. We have abortion, which is, well, it, it's not really different, but people try to make this big difference between if the baby's inside or outside the mother. When there's a politician who is pro-abortion, and unfortunately, most politicians in America are pro-abortion, including you know, President Biden today. Um, that's not okay. We need to stand up against that. And if Christians don't speak up against it, who will? What about idolatry? Uh, Elijah was known for speaking his mind, wasn't he? First Kings 18, 7, and it came to pass when King Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, and that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and hast followed Balaam. 
Balaam, of course, are the idols there. Uh, he's confronting Ahab to his face, a man who could easily have him killed. And, well, did try on a few occasions. And he said, King Ahab, your idolatry is wrong, it's sin, and it's hurting the nation. We need to do the same thing. In front hypocrisy. Uh, Paul is before the Sanhedrin, including the high priest, so he's before basically the Supreme Court of the land. Um, and, and he says something the high priest doesn't like, so the high priest orders that uh, someone slap him in the face. Acts 23, 3, then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for sittest thou to judge me after the law and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law? So he says, you're trying to judge whether I've broken the law and you're breaking the law to do it. You're not allowed to hit me and, and punish me during the trial. You know, you, you have to have the trial and then decide the punishment. Uh, so he's saying you're you're a hypocrite. You're a whited wall. You know that's that's beautiful white shiny paint on the outside, but inside is is all dirty and gross and everything. Uh, people around got upset and they said, <laughs> "You're talking that way about God's high priest." Paul said, "Whoops, I, I didn't realize. That's why I was not means I didn't realize that guy was the high priest. Didn't recognize him." Uh, that that I didn't realize that he was a high priest, for it is written, Thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of thy people. So it's interesting here. Paul is calling out his hypocrisy, but when he realized that that was the high priest, says, well, maybe I should have been a little nicer <laughs> about it. I, I don't think that he was uh, apologizing for confronting the sin. I think he's apologizing for his snarkiness while confronting the sin. Um, because it is important to confront the sin of, of our leaders. But as Paul says, he's quoting the Old Testament saying, you need to be respectful of your spiritual leaders or, or governmental theaters, uh, leaders rather. Uh, so maybe next time you're complaining about the government, realize, yeah, you should complain about the government, but let's not keep it all that snarky. Uh, Peter and John went to pray and they met a lame man on the way. Uh, long story short, they were commanded by the government to not preach. And so they left and they preached some more and they're arrested again. And the, the leaders say, did we not straightly command thee that thou shalt not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. That is, you're saying that we're responsible for killing Jesus. And I don't like that. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. A lot of people jump to this verse anytime they feel like disobeying the government. and we should not jump to this verse lightly. The government here said, do not preach Jesus. And the apostle said, no, we're going to preach Jesus. So don't use this verse to justify speeding or not paying your taxes or anything like that. You know, you need to obey the government. If they tell you no preaching, that's another matter. The church's next responsibility to government, at least the church members, is to participate if you live in a democracy, which we do, we have the responsibility to participate. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. We have a fairly unique opportunity to influence the government for good. And if you have the opportunity to do good and you just don't feel like going out and voting, come on, that's sin for you. You need to do the best that you can. You need to do good by having your voice heard. If Christians don't vote, that means that atheists are ruling the government. Now, Christians are almost always in the minority, but we need to be a vocal minority. We need to let the government know our opinions about right and wrong, which are really God's truths about right and wrong. We need to tell the government what to do. and We need to participate and vote. William Wilberforce got slavery outlawed in England. He was a member of parliament, kind of like a congressman over there, and he got people's votes to do good. Uh, he was greatly influenced by uh, John Newton, the guy who wrote Amazing Grace, Pastor John Newton, uh, who used to be a slave ship captain. Uh, William Wilberforce used his Christianity in politics to say, I believe that slavery and the slave trade is cruel and sinful, so we need to change the law. 
And it took him something like 20 years, but he finally did change the law. In America, the very first abolitionists were Quakers. They were a small Christian group. Uh, later on, many, many Christian groups joined the abolitionist movement and churches spearheaded the abolitionist movement in America. That's great. What's the next movement that Christians can, can participate in to help American society be more righteous? There are plenty of Christians, however, living in places that are not democracies. Uh, Paul did not live in a democracy. He lived under a dictatorship. The emperor of Rome said, do as I say, or I will kill you. And they meant it. But even in non-democracies where Christians don't have any formal say in government, Christians have influenced the government in many, many, many ways. Uh, infanticide was very common in Rome uh, and Greece and you know the entire Roman Empire. If there's a, a baby that's crippled or weak, sick or whatever, you just kill them. In fact, there's an awful lot of uh, Roman and, and Greek fairy tales where there's an unwanted baby who's just left in the forest to die. Because if I kill it, then that's murder. But if I leave it in a basket on the river or in the forest, well, then the gods can decide if it lives or dies. And of course, these babies are always heroes, so they get rescued and grow up to be heroes. I mean, even the founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, were left to die on a basket in the river, but a wash up on shore and a wolf found them and raised them and they became mighty warriors. Yeah, it's very sad how common the theme of just leaving babies out to die was in Rome. And it was Christians who first fought against that and made it culturally unacceptable to kill children. Prison reforms around the world were sparked by Christians and churches and many in places where they did not get to vote, uh, where you know, someone breaks the law, so you throw them in a pit and throw away the key, and they don't have adequate food, water, sanitation, and it's awful. And Christians realize even if someone broke the law, they're still a human being, they're still made in God's image, and they deserve some measure of dignity and respect. Uh, it's come to America's attention in the last few years that many of the prisons we have uh, down south along the Mexican border are just not run very well. And there's kids in cages, there was one report that came out that uh, kids were not given toothbrushes or soap or blankets. I'm like, come on, it doesn't matter what kind of laws these people have broken, uh, do what you need to do. But anyone in American custody ought to have simple things like soap and toothbrushes. If you don't have, if you're not giving your prisoners toothbrushes, you're not treating them like human beings. That's, that's not okay. And it's always been churches who is leading the way and taking care of the least and the worst parts of society in the prisons. Women's rights around the world have been spearheaded by Christians. And that's not to say that churches have always been good towards women. There's many sad, sad stories about churches who did not treat women very well. However, real godly people who love God are going to obey the Bible and treat women right. Uh, here's two stories uh, in China. There was a missionary lady by the name of Gladys Aylward. She was really cool. If, if you were looking for a biography to read, find one of Gladys Aylward. She was very exciting, awesome lady. Uh, went out um, and, and one of the things that she fought against was feet binding. So they would take little girls' feet and they'd snap them and tie them like that. And, and the bones would heal all broken. And you know, it was, it was excruciatingly painful and terrible, and it would cripple the girls for the rest of their life. They have to hobble around in, in great pain. And she said, this is absolutely cruel. We're going to put an end to that. And she campaigned against foot binding for many, many years. And she eventually, almost single-handedly, got that cultural practice of crippling girls abolished. Because she said, it's, it's cruel. We don't do that. Christians ought to be kind to one another. Uh, in India, there was a practice of if the husband dies, you burn his body and the wife is either thrown on top or is expected to jump on top and be burnt as well. You can read about that in uh, Around the World in 80 Days shows that. Well, missionary William Carey came to England and he put a stop to that. And again, for many, many, many years, he had to fight and say, murder is wrong. The Bible says so. 
And here's just another example of Christianity doing good in government. In conclusion, the church and the government are different, but they do have responsibilities towards one another. Uh, they have different roles and they should not try to do each other's role. The government's main role is to provide justice for its people. If it's not providing justice, it's not doing its job. The church's main role is to preach the gospel to all the people, to all the world. And if the church is not preaching the gospel, it's not doing its job. Stay in your lane. I don't appreciate when pastors turn the church into a stump speech for a candidate. Um, yeah, there, there can be times when a pastor needs to talk about current events, that's fine. Needs to apply the scripture to what whatever's happening in government, that's good. The Bible should not just be theoretical. The Bible should be put into practice. So it is fine on occasion to talk about current events and current politicians and things like that. But so many churches and governments uh, sorry, churches and pastors, are so focused on preaching about a politician that they forget that they should be preaching about Jesus Christ. He is our main focus. Everything else is secondary. Preach about Jesus. Stay in your lane. Uh, and again, the government, uh, stay in your lane, government. Do not tell the church what to do, what to think, what to preach. Stay in your lane. As American citizens and members of a congregational-led church, Christian Baptist American citizens have a lot of influence in both arenas. And they should not be 100% separate from each other. They can't be 100% separate from each other because you're the same person who has political ideas over here and religious ideas over here. Your religious ideas should definitely influence your political ideas. You should be uh, participating in politics in a godly manner. However, remember, they are two different arenas. Use your influence in the church wisely as a member of a congregational-led church, and use your influence in the government wisely as a member of a democracy. Do both to the glory of God. Well, we finally done it. We finished the acronym for Baptist Distinctives, and I hope you've learned something. I hope you understand what the Baptist Church is all about now. Let's go over that acronym one last time. B is for Biblical Authority. Today, we looked at, you know, Thomas Jefferson and, and all that. Who cares what they think? Let's look at what the Bible says when it comes to uh, Baptist doctrine. Our authority does not come from a pastor. It does not come from a politician. It comes from God himself through the Bible. A is for autonomy of the local church. We here rule our church and we are accountable to Jesus Christ as the head of the church. No human being on earth is the head of the church. P is for priesthood of the believer. You can go into God's presence. You could pray directly to God through Jesus Christ, our high priest. T is for two ordinances, baptism, which we do by immersion. Uh, which signifies our total commitment to God uh, being crucified and our, our uh, body is buried, our old flesh is buried with Christ and risen again with Christ. And of course, the Lord's Supper, uh, where we remember what Jesus did for us. Uh, eyes for individual soul liberty. Uh, we are accountable to God at the end of the day, not necessarily to one another. Yeah, there is authority in the church and in the home and in the school and in the workplace and in the government. But at the end of the day, it's not going to be Pastor Green uh, that I stand before in judgment. It's not going to be President Trump or President Biden that I stand in judgment before. It's going to be God himself. Uh, S is for saved church membership. Uh, we believe that to be a member of a church, you ought to be a Christian, a fully committed Christian. T is for two offices, uh, the pastor, whose main job is to preach and teach God's word and to pray, and the deacons, who are the servants of the church, and S, the separation of church and state. Both very good, both very important, however, both different. Well, the Lord bless you today as you strive to obey him and obey his rulers here on earth. God bless you.